So today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, 4th Canto, chapter number 22, Prithya Maharaja's meeting with the Kumaras, text number 6. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Atakasana asinan Atakasana asinan Svadishnesh viva bhavakan Svadishnesh viva bhavakan Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada the four great sages were elder to Lord Shiva and when they were seated on the golden throne they appeared just like the fire blazing on an altar. Maharaj Prithu, out of his great gentleness and respect for them began to speak with great restraint as follows. Purport. The Kumaras are described herein as the elder brothers of Lord Shiva. When the Kumaras were born out of the body of Lord Brahma, they were requested to get married and increase the population. In the beginning of the creation, there was a great need of population. And therefore, Lord Brahma was creating one son after another and ordering them to increase. However, when the Kumaras were requested to do so, they declined. They wanted to remain brahmachari throughout life and be fully engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. The Kumaras are called Naishtika Brahmachari, meaning they are never meant to they are never to marry. Because of their refusal to marry, Lord Rama became so angry that his eyes became reddish. From between his eyes, Lord Shiva or Rudra appeared. The mode of anger is consequently known as Rudra. Lord Shiva also has a Sampradaya party known as the Rudra Sampradaya, and they are also known as Vaishnavas. Вас седая на золотом троне, четыре великих мудреца, старшие братья Господа Шивы, были похожи на огонь, пылающий на алтаре. Сдерживая переполнявшие его чувства, Махараджи Притху, который отличался необыкновенным благодарством, почтительно обратился к четырем кумарам с такими словами. Комментарий. В этом стихе кумары названы старшими братьями Господа Шивы. Господь Брахма попросил кумаров, которые появились на свет из его тела, жениться и увеличить чис численность населения Вселенной. На заре творения было необходимо заселить Вселенную, поэтому Господь Брахма одного за другим создавал сыновей и просил их производить потомство. Но когда он обратился с этой же просьбой к четырем кумарам, те ответили отказом. Они хотели всю жизнь оставаться брахмачари, полностью посвятив себя преданному служению Господу. Кумаров называют наичтика брахмачари, подразумевая, что они дали обед безбрачия. Их отказ привел Господа Брахму в такой гнев, что его глаза покраснели. Тогда их из межбров, межбровья Брахмы появились, появился Господь Шива или Рудра. С тех пор состояние гнева называют Рудрой. У Господа Шивы тоже есть своя Сампрадая, известная под именем Рудра Сампрадая, 
и ее представители также являются вайшнавами. Нандейха Шри Гуру Шри Джата Падакамала Шри Гуру Вайшнавам Шча Shri Rupa Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadaitam Savadhutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakon Vitamscha So these Kamaras, they are very famous <laughs> Brahmacharis. <laughs> Their father had a plan for them. Get married and have children. And they refused to do that. Brahma was rather disturbed with them. Over But they were staunch brahmachari. Tapasa brahmachari na shamena cha damena cha tya gena satya salja brahm. This is the vow of brahmachari. He wants to remain fixed in hearing and chanting about Krishna. He does not want to become distracted. From being fully absorbed in hearing and chanting about Krishna. This is actually recommended as the ideal thing for a man to do. Remain brahmachari throughout the entire life. Sometimes it is said, no wife, no strife. No wife, no strife. Strife, strife means Struggle. headache, difficulty. That is the propaganda from the brahmacharis. No wife, no strife. But the householders, they say, no wife, no life. <laughs> So the brahmachari, he is lamenting, you see. The brahmachari, he is lamenting. And the household is also lamenting. <coughs> the brahmachari is, is uh, lamenting, oh, there's this cute young brahmacharini, I wish I could, you know, I wish she could be my girlfriend, you know. The house is lamenting, oh my God, look what I get stuck with for my whole life. <laughs> so which lament is better, you see? <clears throat> the brahmachari, he will get over that. <laughs> As he advances in Krishna consciousness, and he will come to a higher levels of understanding. He will come beyond the bodily platform as he becomes more and more absorbed in Krishna Bhakti. 
So he will get over that lamentation. But the householder, he's permanently stuck. <laughs> Therefore, it is recommended brahmachari. That is the ideal position. To be. <clears throat> of course, if one can utilize uh, one's genital for producing Krishna conscious children, that is also glorious. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati said that I would be prepared to have sex 100 times if I can produce Krishna conscious children. But he, but he never did that. He always remained brahmachari. Of course, one should take whatever position is favorable for Krishna consciousness. This is not the international society for brahmacharis. Nor is it the international society for grihasthas. This is the international society for Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we see someone will take the vow of sannyas. <laughs> that I want to become lifelong brahmachari, staunch brahmachari. But then they become disturbed by a woman and they fall down. So it's better not to be some artificial renunciate. Better to become an honest householder. It is compared just like the <coughs> crocodile and the elephant. There is a pastime, Gajendra the elephant. He was being attacked by a crocodile who was within the water. So, because he was in the environment of the crocodile, he was being defeated, even though he was a more powerful animal. Because he was in the crocodile's domain, the crocodile was defeating him. Yeah. So, it's better, Prabhupada explains, that one should be in one's own natural atmosphere. If he is more suited for being a householder, it is better to be a householder. Because there he will have a strength in the, the war against Maya. There's no point in being an artificial brahmachari, making a show. When, when one's heart is actually inclined towards being a householder. But if one can actually manifest the qualities of brahmachari and be fixed in that mood, then he is in a much better position. Because the household life, it is called dark well. Sometimes, out in the countryside, there is a well that was dug, but now the well has been abandoned. And you come walking along through the tall grasses, and you just happen to fall into this well. Someone may come walking along in the tall grass, and, it's an, and they don't notice, and they fall into this well. And what will they do? They're far away from anyone. They're in a remote rural area. They've fallen into this well. They're crying for help. Nobody can hear their cries for help. They're stuck in the well. So sometimes household life is compared to that. 
The dark well of household life. So if one can remain brahmachari, you see, then it's very conducive. The brahmachari, he can easily live in the temple, you see. Because his material needs are very simple. He can be engaged from morning till night simply in Krishna consciousness. Attending, rising by four o'clock in the morning. Putting tea, taking bath, putting on the tilak, dhoti, kutta. <coughs> coming to Mangalarti. <coughs> chanting japa with the devotees. I'm worshiping the spiritual master, hearing the Bhagavatam class, engaged in wonderful activities of preaching. In this way, his whole life can easily be filled up, the whole lifetime can be filled up with pure Krishna Katha. But as soon as he gets married, now he has to maintain his wife and his children are the, you know, that are becoming. So he has to go out and get a job and work for some karmi in some material atmosphere where nobody knows about Krishna. And he has to do it every day for hours and hours and they work him so hard he gets so tired. He doesn't want to do it but he has to because he has to maintain his wife. And it's for the whole life. He has to spend 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years working every day, practically the whole week. And then even on the weekends, the boss calls him in, well, we need some extra help on the weekend. You have to come in this weekend also, Saturday and Sunday. You have to work seven days this week. And there's no end to it. Your whole life you have to be a slave of some karmi employer. Until finally there's no energy left in your body to do anything. Then they say, okay, now you can retire. Now that you have no energy left, you can retire. So, in this way, the house of life is a great austerity. And brahmachari life is like a picnic. The only problem is if the brahmachari is constantly lusting after the women, you see. Then that brahmachari life is torture. Therefore, the brahmachari is taught not to lust after the women. He is taught to address every woman as mother, Mataji. Because who would, what, what, uh, what gentleman would ever think of having sex with his mother? So that is the Vedic culture. Uh, we call the women as Mataji or mother. Many, many times Srila Prabhupada trains us like this, that we should call the women as Mataji or Mother. <coughs> of course, Prabhupada did say that we should address every devotee as Prabhu also. Because every devotee is our Prabhu or our Master. But he specifically stated that women should be addressed as mother. He never specifically stated women should be addressed Prabhu. He never specifically said women should be addressed as Prabhu. Although sometimes to encourage the ladies, Prabhupada did say Jamuna Prabhu or Malati Prabhu. Prabhupada did sometimes say Prabhu to the ladies also, to encourage them that you're equally as good as your brothers. But what he instructed us was that we should address the women as mother. And we see that's there in our Vedic culture, Mother Jasoda. 
Did we ever hear that Jashoda Prabhu? No, we always hear Mother Jashoda. So Mother is a very, very respectable title. The Mother is worshipable. The son is meant to bow down at the feet of his mother every day, according to Bhagavad Gita. There is a verse that the austerity of the body is to bow down before one's mother and father. And Prabhupada trained us like that, actually. Even with the karmi parents. When Gargamuni and Brahmananda's mother came to the temple, Prabhupada said, you should bow down at your mother's feet. And uh, they did that. They bowed down at their mother's feet. And also, I was trying to do that. Vishnu Jana Maharaj also told me to bow down to my parents, and I did that. Actually, they were very happy. <laughs> because when I was before I was a devotee, I was I was never so respectful to my parents. <laughs> they had big smiles on their faces when I bowed down at their feet. They loved it. <laughs> so this Vedic culture means there is great respect. You see. So if the brahmachari can learn how to respect all the ladies as his mothers, then he can remain peacefully as brahmachari throughout the whole life. Uh, brahmachari should not be fanatical. I remember one time I went to a Ratha Yatra festival. I was brahmachari at the time. And one brahmachari saw, saw that I was I had a simply wonderful a sweet. I was going to eat a sweet. And he immediately came up to me to tell me not to eat that sweet. You see. He said, that's a doughty whitener. In other words, if you eat that sweet, you're going to fall down from Brahmacharya life, you'll have to wear white, you see. So you, you must not eat that sweet, it's a doughty whitener. I noticed a few months later that Brahmacharya was married. <laughs> but I was still a Brahmacharya. For, four, for 14 years I was a Brahmacharya. So we should not be fanatical about these things. Uh, if one is extreme, then that that means one is not peaceful mind, you see. A brahmachari means he's equipoised, he's well balanced, he's not disturbed, his mind is peaceful, that is brahmachari. He's not running after women, nor does he hate women. He simply sees everyone as Krishna's parts and parcel, and he does his service very nicely, that's all. Of course, to protect his brahmacharya ashram, he takes care not to be alone, with, a, with especially with a brahmacharini. And if he's, and he does not unnecessarily talk with the brahmacharini. Uh, just whatever is necessary for the service. But it's not that he tries to develop a close friendship with one of the brahmacharinis. He just deals in an official manner. As Mataji. So in this way, the, the brahmachari, he can safeguard his brahmachari consciousness and not get entangled in Grihastha Ashram. But then if, if he's too much disturbed, then he may take household life. 
But he should take that training he received as a brahmachari and utilize it to be a grihastha brahmachari. He should not be in the enjoying mood now that I am married man. No. He must keep that transcendental renounced mood of brahmachari even when he is uh, grihastha. Because if he develops enjoying spirit, then he becomes grihamedi. He becomes materialistic also. We see in our Iskand that many times happen. A nice fired up brahmachari, he gets married, and then his spiritual life falls apart. He stops getting up for Brahma Mahurta. He stops chanting his rounds, he stops following the principles, starts listening to mundane music, so many things. So, um, one should be a brahmachari, is, uh, once every young man should try to be an ideal brahmachari. That is the best training to become a sannyasi. And it is also the best training to be a first class grihastha. So the Brahmacharya Ashram it is actually the most important ashram in our movement. Because it is the training ground for first class grihasthas and first class sannyasis. So, of course, there's the Brahmacharini, she's a similar thing. That's Prabhupada. There was no Brahmacharini in the Vedic culture. And all the girls were married, but even before they attained puberty, they were already married. But because nowadays uh, the girls aren't married properly in proper timings, Therefore, to facilitate them, Śrīla Prabhupāda um, also allowed brahmacharinis. That the girls, they can uh, cultivate um, qualities of chastity uh, and focus on uh, developing Krishna consciousness. Of course, Śrīla Prabhupāda said, all the girls should be married. And he said, all the boys should remain brahmachari. And he said, that is the dilemma. I want all the men to, stay, to remain brahmachari and all the women to get married. And so somehow or other, Krishna takes care of everyone. If we just fully surrender ourselves to Krishna, Ananyashchyanta yantomang ye jana pariyapasate teisham nichapiyuktanang yogachemam vaham yaham. For those who worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, I preserve what they have and I carry what they like. So all every devotee really has to do is just fully surrender to Krishna. Be completely absorbed in having no desire except to please Krishna. And then Krishna will perfectly arrange everything for you. Everything will be perfectly arranged. And so there's no anxiety. Actually, Prabhupada one time said, he said, any of the girls, if they learn how to be very first-class cook and they learn how to be very chaste, I will personally arrange for their marriage. So this is the equality for the girls. They should be very, very chaste. And they should learn how to cook very, very nicely. That is the first class qualification for the girl. So anyway, if we if we follow these principles very nicely as Prabhupada has given us, 
Ir jeigu mes vykdame šitos visus dalykus, kuris propadė mums dalį? Then we will be one very big happy family all over the world. Mes tapsime vieną puikia didelę gražią šeimą. We don't need to change the system that Prabhupada has given us. Nereikia reikalo pakeisti sistemą, kurią propadė mums dalį. What Srila Prabhupada has given us is perfect. We simply have to learn how to absorb ourselves in this Vedic culture that Prabhupada has given us. Because that will nourish and enhance our spiritual advancement. And that will enable us to become more and more and more Krishna conscious. More and more happy. And will assure us that we can go back to home, back to God at the time of death. So now I can ask if there's any questions. Can you tell something about Vishnu Jana Swami? What about him? Something, tell about him. You want me to tell something about Vishnu Jana Maharaj? <clears throat> wow. <laughs> wow. Vishnu Jana Maharaj was an absolutely incredible person. <laughs> Nitai Nitai Gora Chandra Ki Jai Shri Shri Vara Dhamara Ki Jai Actually Krishna sent Vishnu Jan Maharaj to Austin in answer to my prayer. I was praying for pure bhakti. I didn't know how to achieve it. I was praying that God will guide me how to become a pure devotee. And within several days of praying like that, Vishnu Jamara shows up in Austin. Srila Prabhupada had told him to open ten temples. That was his order from Prabhupada. So he opened one in Houston, Texas, which is a flourishing temple now, a big, big temple. And then he heard that there was um, the the Austin, which Austin, Texas, was a the state capital. It was the like it was the mecca in those days for the hippie movement. That's where all the hippies went to Austin. So the hippies had a street market that they, the city allowed them to do on just right across from the university campus. They set up a market on the street selling incense and beads and all this hippie type stuff. They, the, the government let them do it. And one hippie had met the devotees, who had met the devotees, he was selling incense, but he, was, he, he shaved his head and he had a sika. And he was selling Prabhupada's books along with his incense. No, no, one hippie. So Vishnu Maharaj heard about this. See, there was no devotees in this whole town. But here was a hippie who shaved his head with a sika and he was selling incense along with Prabhupada's books to the he thought, wow, this is like something a good place to go open a center. <laughs> Sounds like the people up there are ready for devotees to come. <laughs> so he came there, he had no he had no money, he had no vehicle. <laughs> he had his danda, he had a blanket, he has a razor blade and a toothpaste, <laughs> toothbrush. <laughs> he had the first canto of the Bhagavatam, the original brown Bhagavatams that came on the ship. He had those. 
So he had one boy from Houston drive him to Austin and drop him off. So he was there with no vehicle, no money, no vehicle. And he had a few cases of Back to Godhead magazine. That was it. He had no madanga. He had no kartals. He had no harmonium. <laughs> well, how can he start a temple? No money, no musical instruments, no vehicle. All he had was his danda, his blanket, his razor blade, tooth toothbrush and a first can of the Bhagavatam and a few BTG. That's all he had. <laughs> he didn't know anybody in the town. He had no place to stay. He had no money to even to get food to eat. Nothing. That is, that is called sannyas. So he shows up in town. <clears throat> So he went to that street market where all the hippies were hanging out. He started clapping his hands and chanting. One devotee all alone just clapping his hands, singing. But I tell you, when Vishnu John Maharaj would sing, he was like a Gandharva. Papa noted that he had the ability to enchant people by his kirtan. So just by singing he attracted so many hippies. Who is this person with a shaved head and this bright saffron robe singing so beautifully here on the street? So he would tell the hippies, he would say, you invite me to your home and I will turn your home into a temple. So he would do that. He had a Nama Hut program going on. Every night he would have a, a Nama Hut in a different house. And all day long he would sell the Back to Godhead magazines for 25 cents each. He would take all of those, all that money, and he would go to the grocery store and buy the boga in the late afternoon. He would go to the house uh, where he's having the program that night and cook a wonderful Pashadam feast. And then we would all come uh, in time for the program and he would do the kirtan, he'd give a lecture. And we would be absolutely enchanted by his words. He was absolutely amazing. Like somebody who just dropped in out of Vaikuntha. So, um, within a short time, he made so many devotees. Now, remember, he still didn't have a house, he has still no facility. But one, but two Brahman, even when there was no temple, it was just a floating Namahat program. <laughs> Two men surrendered and became brahmacharis. Even though there was no temple, there was no place to stay. They were just living on the street. But one of them had a vehicle. He had a jeep, a four-wheel drive jeep. So he later on became Dvija Hari Prabhu. So anyway, but then there was one professor at the university, an English professor. His name was Ray Neubauer. And he was also very inspired by this Swami. So he had, Swami, I will rent a house. My wife and I will live in one room. And then you all can have the rest of the house for the temple. So within a matter of weeks, he had no money, he had no vehicle, he had no <laughs> followers, he had nothing except his hands and a set of Bhagavatam and Dandu. <laughs> within a matter of weeks, he had a temple building. He had surrendered devotees who were working under him. <laughs> He had a first-class jeep that would drive even on the land. Four-wheel drive. Actually, they told Prabhupada about that jeep. Prabhupada said, yes, that is sannyas. 
can go anywhere. So anyway, I was also I was captured by Vishnu Janma. Uh, I was at the time I was a songwriter. I wanted to make a spiritual revolution on this planet by writing songs that would elevate the consciousness of the whole world. But I couldn't figure out how to write such songs <laughs> to even elevate my own consciousness. <laughs> so I was praying to God to guide me now. What do you want me to do? I was praying, 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 praying. Please guide me how to become your perfect living. I was staying with a friend named Mike. And one day, a friend of Mike's, her name was Margaret, she came knocking on Mike's door. There's a Hare Krishna, she came in, she said, there's a Hare Krishna Swami in town. And he will be in my apartment in one hour. So that's how I met Vishnu Chan And he invited me down to the cell of the uh, love feast down in the park. It was very simple love feast. <coughs> Three preparations. Sweet rice. Apple chutney. And uh, potatoes, boiled potatoes with sour cream and turmeric. But when I ate that prasada, I was no longer in this material world. <laughs> so, Vishnu Maharaj had, had some real shakti, there's no doubt. And Prabhupada personally told me, he said, you have been trained up under the expert guidance of His Holiness Vishnu Janamara. So I can never forget my Vardhma Pradarshaka Guru. Actually, I always keep His lotus feet in my heart. He is my worshipful Guru. Because he brought me to my eternal spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. So I'm eternally indebted to Vishnu Jan Maharaj. And I'm praying for that day when I can again have his darshan. He's the sweetest, most wonderful Vaishnava that you could ever imagine. Vishnu Jana Maharaj Ki Jai. So any other questions? Yeah. We also have material desires, and like uh, Dhruva Maharaja, he had desire for for prosperity, and when Krishna gave this also, and he gave a uh, pure devotion also. So we had uh, his Brahmacharya and see. If we had uh, some desire for uh, uh, household life, will Krishna also fulfill it, or he can uh, uh, dispel it? Can he give it up? Yeah. Can, if the brahmacharya is feeling some attraction for household life, he can. Uh, <coughs> what is the question? It, it was uh, earlier. He had such a such a desire for hi household life. Uh -huh. Yeah. Can Krishna remove it or it yeah, that's very good. That's very good. The Brahmachari should try to give up that household desire. That's a very good thing. That is his advancement. His question is that like Dhruva Maharaj had a material desire and Krishna fulfilled it. At the same time he got the spiritual life also. 
So if we have any material desires of suppose like household life, enjoying household life, so will Krishna fulfill that and give us the spiritual life? That could be done also. One could have a very strong desire to uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> to be Krishna conscious, but at the same time <coughs> be per disturbed by the desire for married life. So one can uh, become completely surrendered to Krishna. At the same time, Krishna fulfilled that desire for household life as well. It's like Dhruva Maharaj got his material desire fulfilled, even though he was no longer interested in it. He was saying that worldly kingdom like a broken piece of glass, but still Krishna gave it to him because he had wanted it. I don't know if I'm answering the question according to the way it's being asked. That's the answer? That answer your question? I had such a desire before, but now I'm trying to to remove it. Uh, so Krishna will anyway to fulfill it, but or not? Will Krishna fulfill it? Yeah. If your desire is strong to be renounced, Krishna will definitely bless you that you can remain Naishtika Brahmachari. Inasmuch as they surrender to me, I reward them accordingly. That's why I recommend to you that you should go forward in this process by taking also Diksha. You see, that's means you're fully surrendering yourself to Krishna. Diksha means you're totally giving up any idea of independence or being an enjoyer, completely giving it up. That your only desire now is to please your spiritual master, nothing else. <laughs> that will help you to be strong as a brahmachari. That my pleasure is simply to please my spiritual master, that's all. So we're going to end class a little early today because now we are heading out for the Saganas. <clears throat> we'll be back here tomorrow morning for the class. You had this point you wanted to bring? We have to squeeze it in real quick then. Okay. What is the what is the is this the nectar devotion? Is this talking about the Nityananda Vamsa? Yeah. Yeah. Nityan, Nityan, there is, <coughs> there is always, um, uh, anytime there is a true sampradaya, there may be split offs from that sampradaya also. As long as we are in this material world, there will sometimes be split offs from the true sampradaya. The, uh, the, chet, the sampradaya is compared to a tree. The Chaitanya sampradaya, the coming from Lord Chaitanya, it is called the Chaitanya tree. Each follower of Lord Chaitanya, then he, he in turn has his own disciples. And the follower of Lord Chaitanya, he has disciples also. 
And his disciples have disciples who have disciples. And this way the tree branches out more and more. Some branches are healthy because they're, they're, you know, they're in healthy state. But there's sometimes a branch becomes diseased also because they deviate from the original teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Those diseased branches, they, they eventually die and fall off the tree. And just like even now in ISKCON, we have a branch called the Vitvik movement. They are not accepting the conclusions of Srila Prabhupada, they're inventing their own conclusions about the philosophy. And they are claiming to be part of our movement, they're claiming to be the real Hare Krishna movement. They're saying that we are not the real Hare Krishna movement. But they are deviating from exactly what Prabhupada told us in his books. So they, they are, a, a, they, are a, they are, they have uh, cut themselves off in the Chaitanya tree. <coughs> so these things do happen in, in the history of Vaishnavism. Someone, because they have some material desire, they invent their own new movement and they claim it's legitimate movement. It's based on their own material desire. One has to uh, follow in the footsteps of the previous Acharyas. Mahajano yena guttasa pantha. If one invents one's own philosophy, then one is cut off from the Chaitanya tree. So this Nityananda Vangsa, they have invented their own new teaching which is deviated from Lord Chaitanya's teaching. Just like these modern day Ritvik people have done the same thing. So they will vanish into oblivion, but the true followers of Lord Chaitanya, they will create a golden era on this planet in due course of time. <laughs> and does that answer your question? All right, what's the un what is the unanswered portion? he asks about uh, giving the, the knowledge uh, to his passing. Like he says that uh, knowledge uh, is uh, is passed uh, by by means of meditation. And how it is possible? No, no, it's passed by means of Shabda Brahma, transcendental sound vibration. Not by meditation. It's like I can, if I, I can tell you that Krishna is God. You see, I have passed the knowledge to you. If you accept the knowledge, then you can tell someone else Krishna is God. And if he accepts the knowledge, then he can tell someone else that Krishna is God. So it is not by meditation. It is through transcendental sound vibration. That I vibrate Krishna is God, that enters you into your ear, you accept it in your heart. That's how it happens.
All right then, so now we'll head out for Visaganas via our ashram. So we thank you all very much. We'll see you tomorrow morning here at Bhagavatam class. Gantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai